Welcome back to Wake Up, Shift is Happening. I am Deborah Ariel Peach, and I am blessed and grateful to be here with Richard Dolan. Being here. Thank you, Deb. I'm very happy to be here with you. So we, um, we're going to really go with this in the conversation. I love that you have uh, taken on this subject in a way that is about after disclosure. Yeah, uh, you know, writing that book with Bryce Zabel was a great adventure in my life. Uh, I've been researching UFOs as a historian for many years, really since the early 1990s. That's my training. So I'm trained to look at the past through documents and to try to assess what happened and put together a, a, an interesting narrative. You know what? I'm sorry to but, interrupt you. Can you actually share a little bit about your background as far as that part? The Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. So there's a little bit more context with that. Absolutely. I... Uh, I I like to say I backed into the field of UFOs about 20 years ago. I was working on a doctoral dissertation in Cold War history mm -hmm. uh, in New York State at the University of Rochester, where I was uh, totally ensconced in the world of 1950 and Harry Truman and the early CIA and the Russians and all of that stuff. And it had nothing to do with flying saucers because in graduate school, you want to get a PhD, you don't do UFOs. That's just right. not the way. But I stumbled into the topic. And, be, you know, to say that I became interested would be an understatement. I would say obsessed would be about <laughs> right. Uh, an obsession that's continued to this day. But in the early 90s, I was just so conservative on this topic. And I didn't, uh, once I realized that there might be something to this, I didn't, I wasn't asking yet. Were UFOs real? I wasn't mm. there yet. I wanted to know, was this really part of our history, as some writers claimed? Right. That there was part, like, that the generals and admirals and CIA directors did seem to be interested in UFOs, even though they said publicly they weren't. And I wanted to know, were they? And if they were, then how come they kept saying that they weren't? And if they were, did they ever stop being interested? And if they were, why were they interested? You know, all of these logical questions. So I threw myself into this, I thought, Ah, three, four months of research, right. and I'll settle it, and I'll get it all worked out. <laughs> Guess what? Three months later, I was sucked right in. Oh, my gosh. And you went I down thought, the rabbit hole. I, absolutely. And so what I realized is that, yes, this was serious. I started going through all of the early uh, declassified documents that we have. Mm -hmm. It's really only a sliver of what has been out there, but it's enough. It's enough to tell you that this was a real deal. Right. And... One question led to many more questions, which led to more and more and more. And then I realized, when I started out in this field thinking, I only want, I don't want to deal with the weird stuff. That's, can you imagine? No weird stuff. <laughs> I'm going to study UFOs, but no weird stuff. So I'm just going to look that at the... Woo-woo or the weird, right? <laughs> yeah. The next thing I know, it's like being at the beach, and instead of putting your little toe in the ocean, I'm out swimming. And you just go deeper and deeper and deeper. The next thing I know, I mean, I'm just in it. So I ended up writing a, a 500 page history, which was my entry into this field over a decade ago called UFOs and the National Security State. And that covered like the early Cold War. Mm -hmm. It was it was an important book in this field. It and was can really you just state the years, the times of the Covered 1941 to 1973. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that came out, that was really my entry level foray into this field. Mm -hmm. But it was done, I wanted it to be done as a professional historian would try to do to treat this field with some respect, to kind of mainstream the history of UFOs into our actual history. Right. That was my intent. That book came out and people said, wow, great book. How about the rest of the story? So I spent uh, many years working on a sequel volume, which came out later in the decade, UFOs, uh, National Security State Volume 2, which covers 1973 to 1991, the end of the Cold War. That's a 600-page book, and that wow. has... Uh, about 1,400 citations, over 1,000 index entries. I mean, it's a very comprehensive book, dealing, as the first one does, with really three strands of history. Mm -hmm. What are the big sightings, the important sightings and events? Mm -hmm. You could almost treat the book like an encyclopedia, like, what does Dolan have to say about the Travis Walton abduction? And you can re you could find it, read in eight, nine pages, everything you need to know, concise, wow. no BS. The second strand would be the politics. So trying to understand, was there a cover-up? Was there military interaction with this. Who's running this thing anyway? Is it the president or someone else? Mm -hmm. All these political issues, and I, I tried to weave that into it. Mm -hmm. And then the third strand, 
which I feel is something that has been overlooked, but is quite a fascinating story, is essentially our own consciousness in understanding this, or rather the history of ufology, the history of UFO research, in its attempt to grasp this incredible mystery. Right. Where were we in the 50s and 60s and 70s? Mm -hmm. Where were we by the end of the Cold War? Where, were, where are we now? Mm -hmm. That's an evolution of thought. Right. And that's something that I've also been trying to capture in these histories. There will be a third volume mm -hmm. of this uh, out in a couple of years. I'm working on a variety of other projects, one of which intervened is this book, A.D. After Disclosure, uh, that started when Bryce Zabel, my co-author, who is a TV producer, he created the television show Dark Skies mm -hmm. back in the 90s, wanted to option my history books for a TV treatment. Mm -hmm one conversation led to another and we ended up realizing that we both had an interest in this whole topic of disclosure. Mm -hmm. I've been talking about it for years in various lectures. I mean, it was always something on my mind. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about the UFO reality and you're talking about the cover-up, it's inevitable mm -hmm. that you're going to be thinking about ending this secrecy, this great discrepancy mm -hmm. between what appears to be the real deal here yep. and what the official reality which yep. is which is complete denial yep you've got this discrepancy Absolutely. how do we resolve it huge right and so that's all about disclosure and you know a lot of people have been talking about disclosure over the years bryce and i realized we had some thoughts about it and we realized we were kind of simpatico we realized we could do this book and I remember the day we just mapped out the chapters. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's roll with this. And mm -hmm. we, we really got this book out. And I call it a great adventure because no one ever wrote this kind of a book before. Uh, what it, is, it really is a book that deals with two fundamental issues. Mm -hmm. Assuming you believe UFOs are real, assuming you believe that there is a cover-up, then one question would be, how could this cover-up ever end? Mm -hmm. How might it end? Right. I mean, is it impossible? Some right. people say it is because there's been a cover-up for years and years. I've often said the cover-up is, ending the cover-up is a paradox. It's impossible, but it's also inevitable. Mm -hmm. and, and we really talk about why it is inevitable and why it will end. And then the second question, the major theme we deal with in this book, is what happens next right. in our world, in our society? Is it going to be a great thing? Is it going to be god-awful mess? How will it change our politics? How will it change our economics? How will it change our culture? Mm -hmm. How will it change our spiritual and religious outlook? How will it change our science? And how will it change, ultimately, our geopolitics? Yeah. Again, these are issues where you can only do your best at speculating, mm -hmm. keeping your feet on the ground. Right. I'm quite sure that many... Maybe most of the things that we predict will probably turn out to be very different than what we think. Right. But the point of this book isn't really to, to know for sure how it's all going to play out. Mm -hmm. The point of this book is to start a conversation right? Uh, and to get it going. I do think that we have some, some good thoughts, some valid thoughts on how this can all play out. Mm -hmm. No matter what it turns out the truth of this matter is. Right. No matter what we've got going on, you know, who are these beings we're dealing with? Are they extraterrestrial? Are they interdimensional entities? Are they time travelers in mm -hmm. some case? Are they some lost human civilization? Or all of the above. Yeah. So um, I'd love to go, there's a couple things I'd like to go back and touch upon. The, um, one of the things is that this whole thing about the, histor the history yes. and um, the discrepancy that we're at, we're at a chasm right now as far as what the official story has been right. out there. And we're missing... 50, 60, 70 years of our true history. That's right. That's exactly right. That needs to be rewritten, woven into the human experience. That's been part of my mission over these yeah. years is to rewrite that history. Yes, I, get, right. I get that. And especially when you said, yeah. you know, about the encyclopedia of it, right. you know. Exactly. And quite honestly, and, and then here's another thing is that... Um, because one of the things I'm really here to, to support people with is their transformation and moving through this transitional time into the quantum leap of consciousness that we're, many people are aware of experiencing, et cetera, is that um, there's a whole, that whole denial aspect of all of this has created a very dysfunctional experience in our psyche Absolutely. and our emotional Absolutely. body. Absolutely. That's right. So can you, you want to talk about that you know, a little bit? Well, look, you have a society, like I think of a person or a friend who's uh, got an addiction. Yeah. And you want to tell this friend, hey, buddy, you got a problem. And they say, screw you. I don't want to hear about it. 
don't talk to me yeah. about it, right? Yeah. They're in denial. And that denial messes up their entire, everything about their life. Yeah. Goes into this bad spiral. We as a society are in this kind of institutional, cultural denial. Yeah. Thing mm -hmm. is, so our major institutions are saying, it's not real, it's not real, it's not real. It's a big fat joke. It's all these things. Don't pay any attention to it except as entertainment. Exactly. People are realizing that, no, actually there's something to it. People really don't believe it. It's like in the days of the Cold War uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, right. where Eastern Europeans and, and Soviet citizens, they knew their governments were lying to them. Mm -hmm. They all knew it. Mm -hmm. And they would go on with their cultural beliefs, right. regardless of what the government said. That's where we are. Yep. So, so it's like, what else are you going to do at that point? Until the masses get together right. and, and demand change or, and right. shift. So there are, there are many people who are aware of that this discrepancy, but there are, there are many other people who, unfortunately, because, look, life is difficult. You have a job. You've got kids. You've got a mortgage. You've got all of these things you have to do, and they you don't really have time to fight the power and to become heroes. Exactly. It's difficult. So what do they do? They go on this By autopilot design. of life. Hmm? By design, well, I think, a lot of it. It's uh, you know part of the nature of the beast. I think that that reality is used by elites against mm -hmm. people. I mean, partly life has been, uh, you know, for thousands of years, that's just how it is. It's been a struggle and we can explore right. how, you know, w whether that's by design or not. But the thing is, people are, are not, their heads aren't ready yeah. for the reality of what's going on. Yeah. And there, so there is this institutional denial, and I do think it does bad things to our psyche collectively. Mm -hmm. I do believe that's the case. I completely agree with that. So really the, the question I've been asking myself over the years is, granted that we've got this intensely profound, meaningful reality that's, that's there, and that many of us are interacting with and many of us are not, but that's here. Yeah. And that's... And then aside from that is this... So it's a really, it's a different... It's a, so sorry to interrupt you, but kind of what you're, what you're saying is that what I refer to this is we are living in one timeline, an experience, a reality. Okay. And then we've got this other reality that many people are living and we're in this like chasm of like, how do we merge these two awarenesses of what's going on over here with what's going on over here. Well, okay, that's, that's I, I'm not sure if I would look at it exactly mm -hmm. that way. I, I just simply see it as how do we break out of this mental prison that we're in. Right. And I would, uh, and how, how will the vast majority of human beings who are not really thinking about this issue. Subject. How, how will those people get to that, get to that level? of dealing with the reality of a highly telepathic, highly intelligent presence mm -hmm. that is here interacting with humanity right. and the earth in some manner. Look, whatever it is, our our political institutions, our media, all of our cultural institutions are not getting most people to that level. Watching American Idol is not gonna get you to the level of being able to, to deal with us. So my conclusion is that Nothing in our society is likely to get the mass majority of people to that level other than the tremendous shock yeah. of being exposed to this reality. Yeah. And it's a shock that many people will not handle well. Mm -hmm. And it's a shock that some people will learn to deal with. Right. But what will happen, you see, is that even if many people today don't handle it well, their children and their grandchildren and their great 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 grandchildren mm -hmm. will. Uh, in my own est my own observation, I find that change can happen to individuals, mm -hmm. but real change happens through generations. Mm -hmm. I have teenagers, and I see it with them every right. day, where they have grown up in a in a culture with. Um, certain ideas that are are basic to them that I had to learn. Yeah, and. Clearly, that'll be the case with their own children. 
So I think that uh, disclosure and the, the transformation that we're dealing with, I don't see as something that will be an immediate thing. Mm -mm. I don't see that. I'm, I don't see, for example, a, a December 21, 2012 transformation or ascension happening. That's not my take on it. But I do think this. If you go ahead in the future 100 years from now, yeah. those people looking back at our time mm -hmm. are going to look at where we're at and they're going to say, yes, those people, they went through right. a huge transformation. And hey, you know what? 2012 might be as good a year as any to kind of pin it down. Although in reality, I think this change is one that will take place over years, maybe decades. Right. Definitely. So <clears throat> wanted, I wanted to share something interesting with you yesterday. So I have shared with you that I get a lot of telepathic communication yeah. with these non-physical beings, Guardi guardians of the planet, etc. I get um, details and different things yesterday. Okay. And you did a talk here last night. Yes. And so um, I was out uh, on a bike ride yesterday and getting a lot of information I'm in a, uh, okay. a lot of information coming through these days just about things that are going on globally etc and so it was very interesting because my guide said things are really going to shift after the big d and i was like i've never heard this before and i was like the big d and i was like what the hell are they talking about well the funny thing is as i was perusing through your book last night yes go will you please just share with what you have in here about the big d do you know what i'm referring to well, are you talking the day of disclosure? Yes. Yes, exactly. And I saw that in there. You actually use the word Big D. Yeah, we, they, we did. That's yeah, right. Yeah, so can you talk about that? Yeah, it was either the Big Dolan or the Big Disclosure. Oh, we'll yeah, say the Big Disclosure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, both. Maybe it's B. Sure, why not? Yeah, and they're D, D, D. I'm Deb, you know, so. <laughs> oh, right. Hey. Okay. It could be the three D. It's a triple threat here. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, we are moving toward a, a, a moment when there will be a forced disclosure of this reality. Mm -hmm. And and I respect I'm in agreement the, with you, by the way. Sure. I mean, there are many people who, who say, and with a good argument behind them, that why do you believe this? Because after all, look, this secret has been kept it's, very well for many decades, generations. And indeed it has. An it's amazing PR out. campaign. That's right. So the question is, really, what's stopping it from continuing? And indeed, you can make a good argument. You know. We're moving into an era in which people, yes, certain people are tuning into deeper realities here, but a lot of people are zoning out into virtual realities. Absolutely. Video games and everything else. Where, and there's not a, not in many cases, a lot of education that I'm seeing and not a lot of higher awareness in many cases. So it's very possible you could see a future society that's sort of a variation of either Orwell or Aldous Huxley's Brave mm -hmm. New World. Some you know, combination of that, in which we're all basically mind-jobbed 24-7. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think what's happening is that our our trajectory, our rate of change as mm -hmm. a society, so mm -hmm. this is the great variable. You think about what we're doing now here in 2012, having a conversation that's going to be out on the web anytime, going out there. Out. Our ability to communicate with each other, to have a kind of global conversation, it's in a place where, I mean, it, think about even 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. 20 years ago, mm -mm. 50 years ago. We're like, shoo, going yeah. like this. Where are we going to be in another 10, 20 years yeah. from now in our ability, A, to extract information from the world around us, B, to share that information? Yeah. You think about two, two big things in our world. One is uh, the development of smartphones. Mm-hmm with great cameras, great recording capabilities. All sorts uh, of apps. Apps galore. And so is it that impossible to imagine that there's going to be an event recorded on multiple videos that gets out there? Now, there's a lot of YouTube videos already. Some of them are great. Mm -hmm. The problem with most of them is that they don't really, they need, they need a kind of momentum. Right some traction. I do think it's an inevitability. It's going mm -hmm. to happen. We've only had really good cameras on our smart smartphones for a short period of time. Very short, yeah. Think, on the other hand, some, of something like WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. That's another way that the secret can come out. WikiLeaks didn't exist 10 years ago mm -hmm. because WikiLeaks couldn't exist yeah. 10 years ago. We didn't have a global infrastructure for it. We do now, and guess what? Here's WikiLeaks. Yeah. And even if WikiLeaks is put down, you know what? There'll be other organizations, there are already other organizations that are trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. The cat's out of the bag. The genie is out of the bottle. Yes. 
This, we're not going back. So, in other words, leaks are going to continue to occur and there's going to be a big one. Right. It's inevitable. Right. We're only at the beginning of this new era. Yeah. So to assume that <clears throat> we're just going to keep going and today is going to be just like yesterday and tomorrow is going to be like today, you know what? That's a foolish assumption. Right. Uh, we're going through a rate of change which is unparalleled in anything that we yeah. have in recorded history. So I do believe that in an, a time that's this unstable, something's going to jostle something loose. Yeah. And the president or some other big shot political leader yeah. is going to be forced into a position where they have to say something. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to just say everything. P probably the president doesn't know yeah. everything. Yeah. I think we can all recognize that our presidents are pretty much figureheads and sales reps, you know, for brand America, for brand globalization or whatever. Uh, and that there's a power behind that presidency. Right. But the thing is, the, the president and the political leadership will give up as much as they need to to maintain their position. And so that disclosure is not going to be the end of the game. Disclosure is the beginning. Beginning, exactly. It's the beginning of a new struggle in the battle for truth. But the difference will be, unlike today, where you and I have to work on the fringes of the media mm -hmm. on this issue, it's not going to be the case after that moment. Right. Because right. it's going to be on the table, front yes. row center, and the entire world is going to be, going to be talking. And to keep that, all of those secrets down in that environment, I, actually, I believe is impossible. I do too. President can't just say, well, it's come to our attention that UFOs are real people. Well, everyone have a good night. I'm going go on vacation. Shopping. Yeah, go shopping. <laughs> right. We need the... Well, it's not that simple. No. There's going to be a lot of follow-up questions like, gee, how'd you keep this secret all these years? Yeah. Gee, who are these other entities? Yes. Do we have anything to worry about? These are going to be difficult questions yep. to get into. Yep. And people will demand answers. Yep. So we're going to see a new political confrontation. Think of Occupy plus Arab Spring on steroids with probably weapons and guns and all these other mm -hmm. things. It's not going to be. It's not going to be neat. Occupy Area 51? Sure. Mm -hmm. Hell yes. Yep. Occupy Wright Patterson Air Force Base? And exactly. And th sorry. And, and then, people will want answers, is all I'm absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Uh, demand answers at that That's point, right. you know? And like you said, the genie's out of the bottle. It's already out of the bottle. Then it's really going to be out of the bottle. And right. it's then it's a, a kind of a free for all. And what we were talking about before we actually started taping is that. Um, this whole possibility, and this is one of the things that I do talk about a bit on the show, is that whether it's just the um, economic shift that that is at the, we're at the precipice um, with right now, and or disclosure of uh, we're not the only ones on the planet and the only planet that right. has life force, life life uh, beings. Um, regardless, we're, <clears throat> there are many things that are lining up that are about to be to explode into awareness. So yeah. we are at a time where potential chaos on the planet is probably like kind of at its heightened. I agree. And so that this is a time for people to be really grounded, to be really aware, extremely discerning about the information. Exactly. And exactly. Where... Look, we're think of think of this whole al alternative media, alternative culture as a big ocean. Yeah. It's so rich and bountiful, and there's so much life in it, and there's yeah. so much activity in there. But if you lose your footing and you yes. go too deep and you're not careful, you can drown. Absolutely. In other words, what we have is a lot of information. We have a lot of misinformation. We have disinformation. Yeah. And figuring and dis discerning that, it's very difficult to do. It's probably almost impossible mm -hmm. for everyone to do accurately all the time. We're yeah. just human. We do our best. But what, what we can do, mm -hmm. what I have tried to do, uh, simply is to remind myself uh, not to rush into the latest, greatest piece of news that comes my way. Right. I like to take my time, sometimes a little too much time. But this is my training as a historian. I try to look at the past. I try to see the long view. Uh, I, I certainly, in an age of Facebook now, I mean, uh, our world's latest and greatest addiction, where and we all, everything copy and paste. And <laughs> it's great for, for sharing information, yes. but it's also... Ideal for rumor mongering yeah. and for people getting worked up. There are people who just live on drama. Yeah. They love it. Yes. They yes, love yes. it. And so uh, 
and there are rumors constantly afoot in this field. Mm -hmm. There are predictions yep. constantly afoot. ET will make their presence known on fill in the date. Mm -hmm. How many times have we heard this right. in the last decade? Right. Right. It was supposed to happen on this last August 4th during the Olympics. Right. Again. Yes. Well, yes. it didn't happen. Yeah. Okay. And it's constantly mm -hmm. in the works. So my my own advice to myself and to anyone who cares <laughs> is that when you hear another prediction, especially one that's not really sourced or some inside source or what have you, just be careful. Yeah. Just don't let yourself mm -hmm. get too worked up. Have a cold eye. Yeah. Um, and, and as with all of all of these stories that we come across, remember, like, if, you know, anyone went to journalism school, the rule is you find three sources for, mm -hmm. your, for your data. Right. Sometimes it's difficult to do, but it's a good rule. Right. Let's try to remember. And other things that we can all just do when we get new information is, is search it out. Uh, one thing I try to do when I search out late, you know, the latest memes and themes and tropes and whatever that enters our society, mm -hmm. um, Google search engine is very helpful because you can search by date. Right. What that allows you to do is you can actually find the initial moment that like a piece of information comes out onto out. the web. So it's helpful to know where did yes. that first appear. When you see the first instance of mm -hmm. something, the threat of it, that. You don't always resolve it perfectly, right. but it might give you a very good idea right. of how to assess it. We can all be better researchers, right. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is where I would add into that, that this is the, um, this is the area where being telepathic and being able to tune into your higher self and your guides, which is what I do on a regular basis and other people do as well, this is where you can actually also add into the mix another <clears throat> level of discernment, information, and insight, which is very, um, very necessary at this point. So I'm, that's just my part of adding into... Well, I'd know. like to comment on that. I think, uh, let me say, I'm a strong believer in the reality of things like remote viewing and non-locality. Mm -hmm. And this, in fact, is a very important uh, direction that the future of this our whole area of study mm -hmm. needs to go. But there's a danger here. And the danger is how, how will we as a culture, as a community, be able to do this in a way that is truly responsible? Mm -hmm. Because what we're dealing, when we're dealing with something like telepathy, mm -hmm. which I agree with you, it, certainly when you look through UFO case files, yeah. you find again and again and again instances of telepathic communication right. between us and these other beings. Right. Okay. So that's no, there's no question about that for yeah. me. The question rather is, how do we make this phenomenon a mm -hmm. little less subjective? Yep. Because in philosophy and science, there's a distinction between truth and validity. Right. Something that you experience can be true. But if you're not able to have it testable by other people, mm -hmm. to be checkable by mm -hmm. other people, then it's not considered valid. Right. And for myself as a responsible researcher, I try to work with information that is true and valid. Right. Now, it's not always the case. We, mm -hmm. You know, it's not always a perfect situation. You do the best you can. That's right. Right. So the thing is... Uh, when we're dealing with something like telepathy or sometimes channeling or other, let's say, non-traditional ways yeah. of acquiring information, yeah. it's not that we shouldn't, that we should turn a blind eye to them. Right. We shouldn't. Yeah. But I also feel personally that we should treat those with caution as well. Absolutely. Remote viewers can be wrong. They're often wrong. They'll be the first <clears throat> to tell you. Yeah. Uh, people even who have profound telepathic capabilities, they're not always right. Right. Or they're not always interpreting what they or perceive. Getting, absolutely. That's often the case. Yep. In the remote viewing community, they call that analytical overlay. So you're getting something that, that's there, but you're interpreting it wrong. Right. So nothing's perfect. Uh, I think as a, as a human being, I also trust my instincts and my intuition. Mm -hmm. We all have it. But I don't like to rely totally even on my intuition. Mm -hmm. I like to, you know find some uh, factual basis yeah. for me to work with what I've got. So really, this is one of the important issues, I think, moving forward yeah. in our field. Yeah. Because you, you look at this in a certain way, I look at this in a certain way. What I find is that 
we, we don't really disagree. What we do is we look at a different side of this multifaceted phenomenon. Yep. In the past, uh, in, in let's say more uh, intellectually secure days when I thought, I got it all figured out. Yeah, right. Yes, I do. <laughs> Someone who disagreed with me, I would have said, well, I didn't think you're wrong. Yeah. I don't say that anymore. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> but what I, th I think is, if I were to put myself in exactly that person's position, mm -hmm. I'm sure I would agree with them. Right. Because people who look at this phenomenon in a certain way are seeing it from that side. Mm -hmm. the, the problem, if we want to call it that, is that there are so many sides. Right. So what we really all need to try to do is recognize that what we're dealing with is a truly multifaceted phenomenon. Multifaceted, multidimensional, uh, everything. Right. And if you wouldn't mm -hmm. mind, what I would actually like to add to what you were just saying, and for my audience, they know I've actually talked some of, some of this about this, is that you're absolutely right. And even when, as far as being telepathic, um, one of the things that I am very, very clear about is how easy it is to get infiltrated with other beings of information and how important it is to be able to discern and clear your field. This is one of the very foundational tools that I teach people about is how to clear your field so that you're in complete ownership and sovereignty of your energy in all dimensions and whatnot. Because especially with all the mind control, harp, and all the different things right. that are going on out there in the in the in the energy of the world, etc., mm -hmm. it is so easy to get information that comes in. And when you're not really tuned into a specific vibration or a being. This is where I come in with a little different perspective, perhaps, than you. I hear where you're coming from. We just use a different language sometimes. Yeah. It's, I think of it as being calm and clearing one's mind. Yeah. Uh, and yes, I mean, recognizing that we are sovereign of our own beings. Yeah. Totally agree. Uh, and there are, listen, um, I, you know, I'm known in this field as the, the every, everyone uh, calls me the grounded, I'm the grounded historian of this field. Uh -huh. Well, that's... True, I like yes. to think, but in fact, reality is a very complex thing, and uh, there, uh, I do believe. I mean, I have my own spiritual beliefs that there are uh, there's non locality, there's a spiritual element to our existence. Mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe in that. So that uh, are there influences on us, external influences, whether they be bio bio weapons mm -hmm. or entities or what have you whatever the case may be mm -hmm. it's very important that we uh, keep ourselves calm clear and yes sovereign of who we are right I also would like to ask you because I saw on your website there's a book that you've got listed in the book under your books um, it's a Kundalini book yes that's right yeah so I well, thought oh, and it was, I think it was the only one that was listed there. Well, that book is uh, by an author, Richard Souter, PhD, mm -hmm. a friend and colleague of mine, and I uh, I publish one of his books and I sell his other books. Right. Yeah, Richard wrote Kundalini Tales back, uh, oh, about almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating book about his own, uh, it's an unusual, unique book dealing with some political analysis that he's very astute at, but his own spiritual journey mm -hmm. and how kind of those two things work together in a sense. Right. But yes, he's a practitioner of, uh, of Kundalini yeah. yoga and is very aware of the Kundalini energy in himself. Right. right. He's talked about that quite extensively. So if we were going to talk about like your spiritual journey and, yeah. you know, your practice or your, where would you, what would you want to share at this point? Well, I have a philosophy and I do have a practice and I guess you could say it's Zen. Mm -hmm. So I've certainly I've, uh, in my own philosophy of life, if there's any one word to characterize it, that would be the word. Okay. Which simply means uh, no no fear, no hope. You live in your moment. Mm -hmm. That's what Zen's about. Mm -hmm. It's about stripping away illusion to the best of one's ability, polishing the mirror, as we often say, uh, and accepting what comes to you mm -hmm. without without illusion, without without attachment to uh, strongly held opinions about what you've got. Right. That's a challenge. Yeah. I don't say that I'm, I'm a master at this. Certainly right. I'm not. In terms of... Uh, non judgmental Yes, exactly. I practice it because I, I think that's what I need the most. Right. We all, I'm a very, very hard-driving, ambitious yes. kind of person in many ways. Mm -hmm. I push myself. Yeah. Maybe. 
And to me, Zen is really the most intelligent kind of practice for me in my life. It's, great it's, helped, it's helped me tremendously. In terms of spirituality, I've had uh, experiences in my life, I'm not ashamed to say at all, I'm very open about it, in which I feel very strongly I had spiritual experiences. Um, you know, on a number of occasions I've, I've felt that there have been uh, very strong connections with non-physical non entities mm -hmm. that have interacted with me. Uh, interpreting those is, is not something that I, you know, I, I can interpret them any number of ways. Right. But, no, I'm satisfied in my own life that there, I mean, think of it this way. When I've, you know, my own uh, journey in this life, mm -hmm. I've gone through so many phases I can't even t tell yeah. you. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I had uh, become an atheist. I thought, well, belief in a transcendental reality is simply wish fulfillment. We're afraid of death. You know, all of the yeah. arguments that you could imagine. And then I had a moment of insight. It's funny, actually. Not a revelation, mm -hmm. an insight while feeding my dog. Okay. It's a funny story. My dog what was saw your dog's me. name? His name was Rocky. Okay. He was a beautiful little dog. Mid-sized dog. And uh, he saw me getting a can of dog food for him. I had to be 21, 22 years old. Right. And he knows what I'm getting. He knows that there's food in that can. And he's getting excited. And he's wagging his tail. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, you're a cool dog. So I, <laughs> I'm opening the can of dog food, and he's getting more and more excited. And then I put the food in the bowl, and he eats. And I'm watching him. I'm thinking, he's a very intelligent animal. He knows me. He knows there's food in that can. He knows... A lot of things that I'm not aware of, because he's got a great sense of smell and he's got great, great hearing, but he does not know how that food got into the can. <laughs> and he does not know how dog food is manufactured. And he does not know how he's living in a kind of a human-built infrastructure out of his natural environment. And he does not know what the moon is or what the sun is. In other words, it's not that he doesn't know. He can't know, because his brain just isn't set up like that. Right. And I thought at that moment, I realized... Gee, Rich, you're so smart. Your dog's here. Yeah. You're here. What's there? Yes. What's there? Yes. In other words, what what is beyond even our human, yes. our ordinary human capacity to comprehend reality? And I thought, you know, Fantastic. here you are denying that there's this other reality, and you're so arrogant. Who the hell are you to think that you've got it all figured out at 22 years of age? Good for all you. Right. I love it. So that moment... It's not like I became transformed, mm -hmm. but it opened me personally to possibilities. And from that point, I started looking for what I felt would be evidence of a transcendental reality. And guess what? Started finding it. Interesting that. Doesn't mean that I consider that to be proof. Mm -hmm. I, I will always have a fundamentally scientific mentality. It's just sure. how, and I'm happy with that. Yeah. I'm trained as a historian. I'm trained to look for evidence. And I personally feel that that's important. Mm -hmm. So I continue to do it. But I also recognize that science as we have practiced it has its limits when we start dealing with the ultimate nature of reality. Let us call it a, a non-local. You know, one of my favorite paintings of all time is by Raphael. It's called The School of Athens. And in this painting, it's a beautiful image, re Renaissance. You have uh, a depiction of, at the center of it, Plato and Aristotle two great Athenian philosophers. And Plato, they're talking to each other, arguing. Plato's pointing up, uh, Aristotle is pointing down. Right. And it's a perfect depiction mm -hmm. of how we perceive reality. It's gone for thousands of years. Plato says, what you see around you mm -hmm. is an illusion. Right. The true reality is beyond mm -hmm. the mere perception of physical, what seem to be physical phenomena. Right. Aristotle says, no, my friend, reality is what you can feel, what you can measure, what you can deal with right. on that basis. And really, I think these are both valid ways of looking at the world, yeah. of course. And that's why Raphael put it in the way that he did. did. I think he felt that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is what really we are all trying to work through today. How do we understand reality? Contemporary science is very Aristotelian, obviously. It's very materialistic. And it doesn't recognize this other reality because it doesn't know how to measure it. Yeah. But I think that that reality is there. And yeah. I do believe that contemporary developments in physics are, when we start dealing with quantum entanglement, yeah. 
and uh, as Einstein called it, spooky action at a distance, which he really, <laughs> and he didn't like it. Einstein did not like mm -hmm. quantum entanglement, not one bit. Right. Because it didn't make sense. Right. How do you have these two photons, particles vibrating, and they're not connected, and you can set them as far as a galaxy right. apart from each other, and they're still connected. Yeah. Makes no, it's faster than the speed of light. Yeah. So there are elements of our reality that good old-fashioned Victorian materialist science doesn't quite get. Right. And we need to find a way to incorporate that in our Experience. scientific par paradigm. Yes, yeah. exactly. Even though we can't really measure these things very well. Right. I think it's there, and I do believe that in the future we'll find a way truly to synthesize our science in such a way that what we call now, inaccurately, the material and the spiritual, right. Are, merging those. are merged. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is not accurate because this this is not really material. We know this is empty space, mostly. Right. It's energy. Yes. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah. We know that the mind, actually, that consciousness, let's go there now, what consciousness does is it collapses the wave function into particles. In other words, all energy, all, all of reality is energy. Mm -hmm. When we perceive it, we perceive it as matter. Mm -hmm. And this is actually been demonstrated scientifically in probably the single most famous scientific experiment called the double slit experiment, mm -hmm. in which it is, it's shown over and over that the observer, simply by the act of observing, yes. determines whether these are yeah. waves or particles. Mm -hmm. right. When you observe it, they act as particles. Yeah, right. When you don't observe, they're waves. How the hell is that possible? Well, the, o the only explanation we have is that our consciousness this does. affects it. Right. I mean, as late as the physicist John Wheeler, who's one of the greatest legends in modern physics, did his own very sophisticated variation of the double slit experiment and right. confirmed it. Right. So consciousness matters. And we, within our consciousness, do have this transformative aspect of what reality is. Right. So all of this has to be incorporated into our, our vision of science and our vision of ourselves. Exactly. Okay, so we've gone kind of far afield. We here. have, and but it's that's okay, great, right? absolutely. And we said we're we're just gonna go, we're going with the flow with this, and that's exactly what we've Good. done. Thank you. So at this time, what we're gonna do though is there was one other thing, and I need to check with my team because we're gonna take a break. We need to check with um, Stephen Bassett and bring him right. in possibly for a couple minutes. No, <clears throat> okay, we're not. Okay, so. We're gonna. <laughs> we just had too much fun. Yeah, I know, and you. So you actually have to go do a talk right now next door. <laughs> you get to, I should Evidently, say, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, but what Carrie Cassidy and I are going to talk about right now um, is the uh, article that came out a few days ago, well, yesterday, from Gordon Duff in Veterans Today. Yeah. Yes, right, yeah. that's right. So, and we've talked a little bit about that, and so a little you know, bit, yeah. yeah. I mean, I. I I mean, since you brought it up, I think it's potentially a very interesting story. I have, I have respect for Gordon Duff in his articles. I don't feel that everything he's put out is uh, has turned out to be mm -hmm. uh, always Valid. true. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even saying it's his fault. I'm just saying that's how it is. Again, this is a breaking story. He talked about an intelligence, uh, Asian intelligence source for this story. Yeah. And ba basically the story is that the Chinese and U.S. navies have had some kind of encounter with what seems to be a hostile extraterrestrial presence. Right. Could be true. My own investigation into this whole matter, not just what he's talking about, but my own lifelong yeah. investigation, is that we're dealing with multiple entities on here here on planet Earth. Yeah. And yes. that they they don't all play nice. And we're also dealing with governments that like to create false flags too. So Yes we are. And so Look, I mean, I've, uh, I've talked about 9-11. And a lot of disinformation. There's disinformation. There's misinformation. Yeah. There's people rushing to judgment. I'd like to know what his sources are. Uh, so far, these are unnamed. I have no idea. So, uh, again, what I mentioned earlier in our conversation is, I think, still good advice, which yes. is let us not rush into so, judgment exactly. yet. Exactly. Let's take it a little slowly. There's no harm in trying to flesh this out right. and investigate. Right, and allow, yeah, exactly, unfold. So maybe what we'll do is we'll check in, I'll check in with you in a Great. couple weeks, week or two or Absolutely. whatever, and 
see, you know, we'll have you back on the show and video Skype if it needs to be, mm-hmm. et cetera, because you're not going to probably be in town. And just, you know, just kind of follow this and see where it goes, if anywhere. I think it's an interesting story yeah. to follow. And yes, I think it's worth follow up. But again, I'm not ready yet to, to yeah. lead to a conclusion on this okay. this time. Thank you for being here. It's been my pleasure. This has been a really awesome conversation. Every every aspect of it. So. I'm very glad you feel that way. I enjoyed being Thank here you. with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. This is Wake Up Shift is happening. You have been tuning into. I'm Deborah Ariel Peach. This is Richard Dolan. Uh, this is his new book. And you've got more coming out. I have one coming out in a few months called UFOs for the 21st Century right. Mind. It's really my attempt to, to revisit the entire topic with a fresh kind of contemporary perspective. You think about UFOs, we think, oh, so old-fashioned, so 1955. Isn't that funny? You know what? It's not. Yeah. It's, as I say, a multifaceted, incredible topic, and that's my intention in this new book, to show why it's incredible. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to take a break and come on back with uh, Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. Thank you.